of Norman Williams Public Library. We are delighted that you are all here this afternoon. Uh, we have a very special speaker uh, in one minute, but uh, just a little business. For one thing, this beautiful, beautiful window here that I adore <coughs> might be just at this particular time of day. If anybody is getting the light directly, there's still you know, plenty of seats over here. So if, if you feel like it's shining right in your eyes, just, just move. We can't do anything about the sun, only us. Um, what, uh, what we'd like to say is the, the, the friends, uh, we invite you all to join the friends if you're not a member already. We have a brand new brochure, one of the authors, uh, who's also a trustee of the library, uh, is here, Gary Horseman, and we're very grateful. And so is Lois Lorimer, is back there, and Kathy Fisk is there as well. Horshed could not be with us today. But we have um, new brochures that are down at the front desk. We invite you all to join because together we do wonderful things, we think, and we have fun. Um, with that said, we have a giving tree down across from the reception desk, and um, we have a wish list from the library, like especially the chairs that are at the front desk we'd like to replace. So if you can, um, I'm going to pass a donation basket, and anything that's in here we're donating to the giving tree. Um, our guest speaker, Margaret, is a local legend, Margaret Edwards, and uh, she said she will introduce herself. But before that, I wanted to introduce Margot Sapper. <laughs> Margot put this together. Um, Margot, thank you. My pleasure. Um, this is our second year doing this, and I see we have a very nice turnout, and I just want to thank everybody who volunteered, because it took a whole big group to get this together. So thank you. And then Margaret? There you go. All right. Well, first of all, I want to wish everybody uh, greetings of this season, and I wore my special vest. <laughs> and I am going to use the microphone. Um, most people want to be heard, and I can usually be heard. I don't want to be overheard or heard too much. So tell me if you're feeling blast. I'm blasting you out of your chair. Blasting you out of your chair? No. No. All right. Um, let's see. Hurry up, girls. You're late for class. <laughs> All right, there are, are, there are chairs here, the seats here. Okay, once I start my spiel, I'm on a roll, so. First of all, I'm gonna talk about the five things or the six things to do if you're not going to write a memoir. This is about writing a memoir, but I realize that not everybody uh, is ready to dedicate themselves to this project. I also realized that, uh, you know, you might start a project, then, you know, you put it on ice for a while, and then you put it on the back burner for a while, and then you move it to the front burner, and then it goes back to the back burner. In other words, a lot of people's process is not uh, start, uh, continue, finish, right? And when you're in those down times, when you don't have the time to dedicate to your project, that does require a good deal of focus. Uh, there are things you can be doing, like doing your knitting. There are things you can be doing to help along not just your own memoir, but the memoirs of people who will be more dedicated than you and probably do it better than you. So they're coming after you, but they need your help. So this is what you can also do. First of all, print and label all the important photos in, that have to do with your life and the life of your family. You've got some of those old photos, and you don't know who the hell those people are. 
And um, you can try to find out by interviewing other people in the family, but um, sometimes those things just, as my father say, said to me, some things just go with you to your grave. You know, you can't, you can't um, remember who those people are, and unfortunately nobody else can remember, and that's just the way it is. But if you print and label all the important photographs that you can get your hands on, you will be very helpful to the next generation. And you even have to write down your own name. People don't know who you are, remember, um, when you're dealing with your great-great-grandchildren. So um, please put your own name there. Put when it was the photo was taken. You can even put why the photo was taken. You label all the people that you can that are in the photo and where it was taken and sort of try to get the year, the time, or whatever. You can say circa. C-I-R-C-A is a wonderful word. It means, I don't really know, but I think it was about this time, right? Circa 1975, 76, 77, who knows? But circa, circa. At least they know it was in the 1970s, and that might be enough. I want you to think about transcribing all letters written in cursive, because guess what? We have rising generations of people who can't read cursive anymore. They've all been reading TypeScript because that's what they learned to do when they were two and a half, three. They learned to type and then, you know, that's who they are. So transcribe all letters written in cursive, all journals, all recipes, and so forth. In other words, type it out. Interview all the elderly relatives and their families that are still Extant. Now, some of us have gotten old enough, so as my sister said, we are beachfront property now. <laughs> um, but there used to be some elderly cousins that I was very glad I sat down and interviewed when I was even in my 20s. Somehow I had a, a focus on the fact these people wouldn't be around forever. And um, I sat them down and I asked them a lot of impertinent questions and they answered most of them. Draw a timeline the dates of important family events, of the important events in your life, and so forth. Check those dates and avail yourself of other family members' recollections. Uh, another thing to do is to go back and visit any scenes you think should be preserved, because they won't be preserved. Only you and your camera can preserve them. How many of you revisited, say, your high school ever? Yeah, good. How many people knew to take a photograph of your high school, which burned down two years later? No, who, who remembered to take a photograph of your high school? How many of you have a photograph? Now, sometimes annuals, high school annuals, have the photograph of the high school. You don't have to do it. But, um, you know, what about that obscure little cabin that your parents used to go to, um, and uh, they took you once or twice, maybe with your brother, but then the drive got to be too long and they decided not to. But have you ever gone and looked up that? Sometimes that can really reawaken memories and it can be nice for other people to uh, see that photograph of that cherished uh, place. And it brings them to recollections that might uh, support or uh, compromise your own. Scan the photos. Scan the photos after you've labeled them all. Uh, I think we are going into a period of time in which scanning um, will put it all in the cloud or something. But I am still a person who believes in print. I almost brought a, a thumb drive here today, but then I decided no, uh, I would just bring, I would bring something like this. This is stuff that's been printed out, right? Printing out is a great thing because Gutenberg Bible and all of that if it's printed, it lasts, lasts longer. I have a lot of reel-to-reel, -reel, have a lot of reel-to-reel -reel recordings of my father reminiscing, and reel-to-reel -reel recordings are extremely difficult now to find somebody who's gonna transfer them over to a CD that's not gonna be able to be played in about four more years. You see what I'm saying? In other words, the media keeps changing, and you think you've got it all down on tape, but it's uh, much more important to have things that are in print. I still believe in print. Okay, so these were the things to do if you're not going to write a memoir just yet. If you're postponing it, if on the other hand you've started it but you've lapsed. Uh, I'm a great believer, as everybody here knows, in um, classes. Uh, if you are busy writing on a regular basis and you have other people 
look to your left, look to your right. Other people are doing the same. They're presenting some of their work to you. You are listening to their work. And then you get ideas for your own work. This uh, writing group is a really, really good way to get yourself started on a memoir, to get yourself continuing on a memoir, and to make yourself finish a memoir. What do I mean when I say finish a memoir? I mean get it into print. Get it into, a, get it into more copies than just one or two or three. Get it into copies that you can then distribute to your family, to your high school, your college, your library, and so forth. In other words, uh, send it to friends that thought you were dead. Send it, to <laughs> send, it, send it to old boyfriends that wish you were dead. <laughs> but it's important to have, to have copies, um, print copies of your memoir. I really am a believer in this. And also the print copies is a great place to put some of those photos that you've been carefully labeling, right? Okay, so I should introduce myself a little bit. Most of you I know, but some of you I don't. I am Margaret Edwards, and I was a professor of English for 30 years at the University of Vermont. Sometimes uh, most people that I know here have heard me suddenly uh, reacquire my professor voice and say, excuse me, be quiet, <laughs> you know, as if you were 20 or 18 or 17 or 16. You know, I ha still have that voice that is, let's be concentrating on the matter at hand, right? And that's another thing that it's good for a class to do. It makes you concentrate on the matter at hand. It makes you understand that what you're doing is valuable because sometimes you think, oh God, who's ever going to be interested in this? You know, or God, I can't bear this. I bet nobody wants to read this. You, you, we all have failure of nerve sometimes and just to have people concentrating on their own work and concentrating on yours uh, can be very, very valuable. Now, I'm finally going to get to the talk that I wrote for today. It's called Writing a Memoir. Uh, I was born in Atlanta, Georgia, so you have to imagine when I say my father, you have to imagine a sort of um, a slightly rotund, very sweet looking guy with very brilliant blue eyes, like eyes like gas jets, who had a wonderful smile and a deep chuckle, who was an architect in Atlanta. My father laughed when I turned 18. And perhaps on the very day of my birthday, he laughed. He said to me, and I can recall his words exactly, I've read that humans are supposed to be at, their height, at the height of their strength and beauty at 18, Margaret. So it's all downhill for, for you from now on. Of course, I scoffed and said, oh, daddy, dismissively. But as I admit, I recall his exact words. And they are part of an analogy expressed by that phrase, as we all know, over the hill. She's over the hill, or he's over the hill. In other words, headed downward, declining, being pulled by a merciless gravity toward the grave. I say, let's reject that analogy. Let's think that, on the contrary, we are moving ever upward. And if the myth of Sisyphus straining to push his giant rock uphill comes to mind, renounce it, renounce it. My upward journey takes off from a song I sang at Girl Scout camp. It was a hymn, and each of its verses was a phrase repeated three times. Maybe many of you are familiar with this. The first verse was, we are climbing Jacob's ladder. How many of you have ever sung that? Oh, a few sprinklings of people. And the second was, every step leads higher, higher. So in the analogy that I prefer, I am climbing up through my years, getting higher and higher. Uh, at each stage, I become more and more able to take the long view with a greater perspective. I can look out and see where I've been. I can contemplate my past with new insight. And there's another usefulness to this way of thinking. My last years and my death are ever above me. They are wreathed as a mountain summit is wreathed in an obscurity of cloud, completely invisible. I may be near that summit now, or it may be some years away. How hard it will be for me to reach it, or how painful it will be, that's mercifully beyond what I can know. 
People deemed spiritually enlightened tell us to live in the now. How many times have we heard that? Live in the now. It's unclear to me what your now might be, but my now gets trivial very fast. My now often requires me to wonder what's in the refrigerator that I can fix for lunch. <laughs> of course, to be fair, living in the now is supposed to mean savoring the present, being conscious of the gift of every day, but here's what I think. We should live in the now only part of the time and not shirk living in the past. Because living in the past, I'm convinced, is one of the best perks of age. Since the pleasure of living in the past has fallen on hard times and needs, needs to be promoted, let me praise it. I admit, nostalgia is perhaps a guilty pleasure, sort of like eating expensive chocolate or pouring yourself one more glass of wine. Also, I admit that certain parts of anyone's past don't bear reliving or retelling. But there is a very good reason to take advantage of the overview that age affords you. And getting that overview organized and set down on paper and then in print as a memoir is a satisfaction not to be missed. I guarantee it. Some years ago, my first cousin Betsy and I began to work on her memoir. First, though, I had to sell her on the idea. Betsy was full of the usual excuses for not writing one. Well, why should I, she said. I'm an up and doing person. I don't even like the idea of sitting down and contemplating my life and trying to figure out what to say. Then she added, nobody would be all that interested anyway. My first strategy was to convince my cousin that we had both lived through interesting times. First the Eisenhower years. We could remember those duck and cover exercises at school that helped us avoid the atomic bomb. And civil rights, I reminded her, plus Vietnam. Betsy had been far more committed than I with pickets and sit-ins. I reminded her, you even got arrested in Chicago. Well, yes, Betsy supposed she could write about that. In 1945, I was born in Atlanta, Georgia, and two years later, in 1947, Betsy was born in Beirut, Lebanon. And that's unusual, I pointed out to her. You may have been raised in Brooklyn, but you started out as a baby in the Middle East. She allowed that, okay, that particular aspect of her life might prompt some explanation. So we commenced the project of Betsy's memoir, having her describe her dad and his unique academic career. Jim Pinkston, that was her dad's name, had been a bright student from rural Alabama who had worked his way through school and eventually, as a professor, accepted the job of being dean of a medical college in Beirut. He and his wife, my mother's sister, began their family there. And not just Betsy, but also her younger brother, Russell, are now grown people who raise the eyebrows of airport officials when those officials happen to glance at either of my cousin's passports and notice place of birth. What got my cousin's little family back to the United States back then was the Israeli conflict with the Palestinians. Quote, Daddy said he thought the Middle East was becoming a keg of dynamite, unquote. Betsy was inclined to put those very words into her memoir, so she did. Betsy accepted my suggestions for short essays that she might write in my uh, absence. She could write something, say, on what she remembered of the house on Midwood Street, but no, I don't like doing this alone, she confessed, and never once has she sat down to write some pages on her own. How we work on Betsy's memoir goes something like this. I fly down from Vermont to see her at Easter, or I swoop up from just having spent Christmas with my sister in Florida. For hours, Betsy and I curl up in her Virginia living room. I am positioned in one corner of a big couch with her laptop computer before me, opened and ready. Betsy stretches out on the couch's other end. She, dic she dictates while I transcribe. From time to time, her husband looks in on us to ask us how it's going. <coughs> Meanwhile, their immense dog, an English mastiff, lolls beside us on the floor like a drunk snoring. I write exactly what Betsy tells me, and then I read it back to her aloud for her corrections or her emendations. She says things like, no, no, not that word, or let's not use that. Paragraph by paragraph, indeed, we are creating this manuscript. Betsy has led a life that provides plenty for her to write about, 
After a few false starts, she completed medical school and became a pediatrician. She married James, a lawyer. Somehow, they managed to raise three children despite no nannies or help beyond just rudimentary daycare. When the first two kids started school, Betsy and James moved to Stanton, Virginia. That's where Betsy's mother and father were living. There, Betsy started her own clinic. She specialized. She wrote a medical column for a local newspaper. A hub in their lives has been Trinity Episcopal, the church where Betsy sings in the choir. It is a serious choir, one that on several occasions has toured England to perform in various old stone churches in picturesque villages. But what can I say about that? Betsy still stops and challenges me. There's hardly anything to write about, Margaret. I've led such an ordinary life. <laughs> Betsy's having been diagnosed with breast cancer was what originally made me uh, get after her about writing a memoir. And I was a bit indelicate about it too, saying, if you beat your cancer, Betsy, you can always ditch your memoir. Not finish it, throw it out, whatever. But, and that but we've always left hanging. Her breast cancer might prove fatal. We agree it's not for us to know what may happen or how or when. Betsy appreciated the true story I once told her of my dying father's compassionate cardiologist. The doctor was a healthy man of 35 who sat long at my father's bedside and looked very sad, commiserating with daddy about daddy's poor prognosis. Yet the very next week, the cardiologist himself was dead, killed in a car accident. My father was astonished and horrified at the news, but then admitted to me that the tragedy had, oddly enough, given him some hope. You just never can tell, you know. As children and on into our adulthood, Betsy and I were never very close. We looked back on it. She had a demanding career, and so did I. We were very busy women from our 20s all the way through the decades until our 60s, when we were physically very distant. And we were physically very distant. She was in New York State and later in Virginia, while I was in California, then in Vermont. No time for long emails or cozy visits, but we drew together after I retired and now are close since we started the memoir. Here, I'm going to read you a sample from the memoir. And these are Betsy's words, and she's describing being both a mother and a medical student. When James heard me say that I might not go to medical school, he said, oh no, You've put far too much into this to quit now. If you get in anywhere, you've got to go. In 1977, I got into medical school in what was always called upstate. Right away, James and I went up to Syracuse and bought a house at 159 Miles Avenue. This was one of, this was one of our good real estate purchases. It was a classic California-style bungalow in a university neighborhood and the only fixer-upper on the block. The owner had covered its beautiful hardwood floors with wall-to-wall -wall carpeting, each carpet a different color, and various horrendous wallpapers covered the walls. The dining room had been a beauty salon, but the house's good features were its fireplace, three bedrooms, one bath, small kitchen, living room, dining room, porch, and a nice backyard. When we walked in to see the house and I pulled up a corner of the carpet and saw the floors were oak, I said, Let's get it. Our two sets of parents signed for it since we had no credit. Uh, and here I'm going to just uh, skip ahead in the memoir. Uh, they fixed up the house as best they could on a very limited budget. It goes on and uh, details that. Betsy goes on to say, that first year of medical school was a difficult year. I can't really remember much about it. James remained in the apartment and stayed in law school intent on finishing I lived in the new house in Syracuse with baby Amelia. I took her to an excellent university daycare center every day. The first time I took her there, I wept. It was a demonstration school. Very nice woman there saw me crying and said to me, oh, I do that every year. So it was normal to feel wretched, and I knew the place was a good one. While Amelia was there, I went to my classes and then picked her up in the early evening. The majority of my study, the major part of my studying, I did on the weekends and sometimes early in the morning. I never was one to stay up late studying. I was exhausted at the end of the day. I was still nursing Amelia when I was going to medical school. I nursed her for 19 months, and it was the basis of the bond we had. But luckily, I was able to learn what I needed to learn without having to study as hard as some of my classmates. I could focus quickly and well on the material 
then be done with it for just a second. <coughs> I'm sorry I'm drinking from a bottle, but there's no place to put a glass, so Mother said it's the most inelegant thing in the world for a woman to drink out of a bottle. Excuse me. Look at that. <laughs> OK. <laughs> um, uh, on weekends, James would come. He would take care of Amelia while I studied. Amelia was a pretty demanding little soul, but she was charming. James must have had some studying of his own to do, but he loved taking care of her. She was very verbal and said a lot of cute things. She also had her tantrums. I remember one fit she was having screaming on the floor about who knows what, and I just stepped right over her. I was tired. I couldn't deal with it. For a while, the people who were in charge of the daycare center wondered what I could possibly be referring to when I spoke of Amelia's meltdowns. Then one day, she must have gotten frustrated and she showed them. They greeted me when I picked her up saying, okay, now we know what you mean. But in general, at daycare, she was well behaved. T. Barry Brazelton, a child development pediatrician at Harvard, wrote that it was fine for children to have tantrums at home rather than lose control of themselves outside the home. I had read Brazelton's books and I felt Amelia's fits of temper were nothing to worry about. I prided myself on my class rank that I was in the middle, in the dead center, in fact, of my medical school class. I may have been average, but in the total scheme of things, I was meeting far more responsibilities than most. Had I had the chance to throw myself into the work wholeheartedly, I think I would have done a lot better. Sometimes women would come to me and ask me, when did I think was the best time to have a child in the course of medical school? I would tell them, never. <laughs> It really had been a bit crazy to have a baby in the midst of all this, but how else and when? I certainly didn't want to be, I did, certainly didn't want to recommend my way as the way. <clears throat> now Betsy and I haven't yet, yet dealt with the immediate present. The memoir hasn't acknowledged how her three children, not only daughter Amelia, but sons Jesse and Sam, grew to adulthood, nor has it described their accomplishments which are considerable. It still needs to recall, record how Betsy sold her clinic and then retired from her practice. She still needs to report on the glorious fact she now has two young grandchildren. Son Sam and his wife Susanna had little Walter on Father's Day in 2018, and just four months ago, daughter Amelia and her husband gave Betsy a second grandson. Yet now, most of what those two little boys will eventually know of their grandmother is right here. There is so much more to be written, but 11 days ago, my cousin died. She died in the early morning in Charlottesville on December the 1st, 2019. So the long and short of what I'm saying to all of you today is, do you wish to be remembered? If so, write a memoir. Thank you. If anybody wants to ask a question about like classes, um, Ron Biller is the director of the Learning Lab, and it's through the Learning Lab that courses are offered on memoir writing, taught by moi. And uh, I urge all of you, if you feel that you could profit by a class, to sign up with me. Um, and uh, certainly talk to me about memoir writing if you wish. Uh, tell me what you've been up to. And can, you, can everybody hear me? Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, some of you who are sitting out there are still working on your memoir and keep at it, keep at it, you know. Don't fail. And uh, I want to thank you all for coming today. It's very sweet of you. Bye. Thank you, Margaret. As always, not only so uh, elegant and erudite, but a poignancy that Margaret brings to all of us, and that's, that's very special. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's beautiful. And um, in the audience, too, today we have several of the trustees of the library. Um, I see Gary, Joe, and Ron. And Ron is the uh, president of the Board of Trustees for the library. Ron, would you like to say anything while we're 
before we go back to eating more stuff. <laughs> oh, in that case, I won't say very much. <laughs> uh, just welcome to our library. Glad to see such a uh, good crowd here and um, enjoy yourselves. Thank you. Thank you all. Yes, I just wanted to say I've made several books, um, Margaret, with uh, pictures. My father always dated the pictures, so I did with Shutterfly. And uh, I made one of my, my, my own life, my husband's, both of my daughters. And now my daughters take all these pictures, the digital pictures with your cell phone. What happens to those? And so what I do every single Christmas for my grandchildren is I put in order all the pictures that I've received that the mother has done, the birthday parties, the class picture, <laughs> and all of that. And I do it every year and give it to them at Christmas time. That's, That's beautiful. beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Does, does anybody else have something they'd like to share um, with the whole group at the same time? I can say that my um, grandmother started uh, she started what, for her kids what she called a life book, and it started with all their you know, baby pictures and growing up, and two of her children, not my mother, but two of her children carried on that tradition, making life books for their children. So it was a good start. Yeah. Nice. Nice. That, that, uh, yes, Kathy. Um, two things. First thing is, I just totally wish somebody who came before me had written anything. And so going forward, I would like my grandchildren and whoever comes beyond that um, not to be saying, why didn't Mimi write down what happened to her? <laughs> and the second thing is that um, Margaret's class is wonderful. And I, I learned a great deal um, taking it. But I need a bit of a shot me arm. Margaret, don't you have a sort of This was supposed to be the shot me arm. I think <laughs> Um, yes, uh, one thing, uh, once you've taken that sort of pearly gates course, the, the beginning, uh, it's um, introduction to memoir writing and it's, um, it's always sponsored by the Learning Lab, um, then you're my baby and I am interested in your work and I, every time I see you, some people duck so they won't see you, every time I see you, say, oh how's the writing coming and people give me a guilty stare and ask me if I've had this cookie or something, you know. Would you like another glass of wine? Um, uh, I do. Every, every year, uh, I give six weeks of, uh, six consecutive um, weeks of a, um, of a workshop. Uh, and I do workshops throughout the year, in fact. And to them, everybody who is working on a memoir is invited. Unfortunately, they are not standing room only. They are, you know, six, seven, ten people maybe. But um, you are always welcome, Kathy, to come to these workshops. And I hope you will. Okay? But those workshops are really um, the gist of it. Once, you, once you've uh, begun, uh, it's, it's very easy to sort of um, pull yourself into continuing, I think. And um, some people are relying on their husband and some people are relying on their wife to write the memoir for them. But I have found that when husbands and wives both sit and write memoirs, that's very uh, instructive too. And their children seem to be pleased about it. So uh, this is an open invitation to anybody. If you have been like Kathy and you have fallen by the wayside and need a prompt, uh, by all means come there. In the middle of January, um, these uh, workshops will start up for the people who have already taken the intro course. And the intro course is one uh, that um, I teach from time to time. And there's enough of a buildup of people who want to take it that I, I do it again. So we just had one that uh, was in the fall. And, uh, and those people, I hope, will be showing up for the workshop. OK? But something's going on all the time about memoir writing. And you can always just get hold of me through the learning lab. Margaret, I actually had a question um, considering um, 23andMe or Ancestry.com and, um, and also um, I think the very enjoyable show called Finding Your Roots with Professor Gates. Um, has the, do you think this has inspired more of an interest in memoir writing? 
I think all writing has gotten to be a little bit easier now that we um, have computers because we can rewrite so much more easily. And even if you just hunt and peck, um, you, you can use what's called, well, one of them is called a dragon app, which is you can talk into the computer and it can transcribe what you say, uh, which is very interesting. And um, uh, I mean, I, I found that I even have that on my iPad. One day, I dropped my iPad and I said, oh, come on, stop it. And lifted it up and saw it right there in the letter I was writing. Come on, stop it. <laughs> so, you know, uh, many new computers have this feature and they don't even tell you about it. Or rather, I don't ever read the manual. So, um, I'm just saying that you can, uh, you can, can, can really, um, in this day and age, with a computer aided, you can go a long way toward um, finding that writing a memoir is easier. Uh, revisions are so much easier, and, and so forth. So I, um, I urge, I, I think that's one of the reasons that things are getting more. Now, you know, everybody always, this, I grew up in the South, and Southerners love to run around to graveyards and say, oh, this is this one, and this is that one. But if you don't know any stories about these people, who cares what's on a gravestone, you know? I mean, it's nice to see the whole life list and the tree and, you know, all that. But what's really important is to get down anecdotes of what it all meant. That's really memoir writing. Not, you know, I'm related to this one and that one and the other one. Right? Okay, so, I mean, yes, Ancestry.com is nice. And uh, there are plenty of books that tell you what to do. But there's nothing that substitutes for doing it. So, okay? Yes, sir. Well, I was uh, pushed at one time by Margaret to write a memoir. And I decided, well, I didn't want to write it here and expose my soul to all people I know in Woodstock. So I decided to go to uh, Iliad, now Osher, where Joe Medlicott, marvelous man who's done memoir of writing for years, was there. And so I walk into the class, who's there? Margaret. <laughs> <laughs> I, I sit at the knee of the master. <laughs> He's a brilliant teacher. And um, some, I mean, you know, it's like, um, if you were a dental hygienist, I couldn't brush my own teeth that way, right? Okay, so I have to go to a memoir class to make myself write my memoir. And I uh, believe in yeah, Absolutely. Uh, and John still won't take my class, God damn it. But so, uh, so, uh, you know, she critiques what I've been writing in Joe's memoir class. So it's as if I'm having, still having a class with her. It's a two <laughs> Anybody else? Meg? Well, I was just going to add to that. I haven't been in that class, but in most writing classes I've been in, uh, whether it's memoir or something else, even fiction, people do bear their souls. And so usually it's kind of, if not actually openly stated, and it often is, that that, that stays in the group. So if anybody wants to write memoir and is worried about that, I'm, I'm sure that um, Margaret could assure the, the group, or you could make it a, a rule of your group, you know, what happens in Las Vegas stays in Las Vegas. <laughs> That's important. It is. Well, I always think of it as an ante room, you know, in a sense, it's the rehearsal or something like that of what, of, you, you're trying out this story of your life and we'll see how it goes. And what usually happens is somebody's very tentative about it and comes to see me and says, do you, do you think I really should read this to the class? And then I look at it and I think, absolutely, it's fascinating. And they say, yeah, we have it. You know, if my old Aunt Susie ever saw this, she'd be so upset. <laughs> I say, oh, well, you know, in 100 years we'll all be dead. What difference will it make? But, you know, honesty is much more engaging than to pussyfoot around something. And eventually, what's interesting is most people come to the thought that the story as it really was is the real way it should be, it should be remembered. And as you work it out, you work it out compassionately, and you don't, in a sense, vilify anybody. You describe what really happened and why it might have happened. It's, it's, it's very uh, instructive, really, most, mostly. As one writes something, one is um, freed from the, um, how shall I say, from the anxiety of it. Does that make sense to everybody? In other words, you usually write a very important story in your life, and then you rewrite it and you rewrite it again and as you rewrite it you make it more and more plausible and as it becomes plausible 
it, bec it becomes um, understandable in, in all walks of life. And uh, therefore, you, I remember having a woman once come to me, and she said, my mother was murdered when I was 13. And I've never been able to write it. I wonder if you can write this story. And I said, well, it's your story to write. You'll have to write it. And she did come to the memoir class, and she did finally write the story of getting off the bus and seeing police tape up against the side of the house. And this was a small Vermont village. And I remember, and she said, I so blame my father for never leaving. And they never found who murdered her. And it was a horrible thing for us to, um, to belong you know, to the school, and we were always the kids whose mother got murdered. And I resent the fact that my father never took us away. And finally, when she finished writing this story, she understood that her father couldn't leave because he felt, he felt that um, that was the only way to remain close to whatever of his wife remained. And she finally understood her father, and the story was very powerful. And I finally said to her, you know, you lost your mother when you were 13, and that is a sad story. Not that she was murdered, that you lost your mother. She could have died of cancer, she could have been hit by a bus. She was dead when you were 13, and it was tragic. And you know what? That freed her to write that story, so that it was no longer the terrible thing of mother murdered, but it was lost mother. And she was able to write a wonderful portrait of the mother that she had known before her mother was killed. And the killing of her mother ceased to be the important part. And only the loss of her mother was important. Does that make it sense to everybody? You start out with something you think, I can't write this, I'm 55, I can't write this, it's so horrible. And finally, you're free and you become part of the story. The story takes the right shape. You see? I mean, that's what I think. That's powerful. Mm. Thank you. Anybody else want to share anything? Well, then as my forebear said, per piacere, mangia. <laughs> <laughs>